From New York City, for our audience worldwide, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, the U.S. economy delivering stronger than expected jobs growth. Validating the Fed's port, Clarida says the economy is in a good place, just as the United States and China look to close out a phase one trade deal. So we begin with the big issue, an unexpectedly solid payrolls report. This was certainly a very solid labor market report. Pretty solid report. Very solid report. A strong number. Good numbers. Really strong. Strong. I mean, across the board. The jobs number did not disappoint. It's pretty impressive. We've not only had a strong report, but we also had a revision higher for the prior number. The upward revision to the prior two months. Don't write off the economy just yet. I'll tell you, it's got a lot of fundamental strength. The U.S. economy is very resilient. They're a lot stronger than people think. The Fed is in a good spot with what they've done and where the data is. But I don't think that the Fed does anything differently as a result of this other than pat themselves on the back. A pat in the back for uh, Chair Powell. This is like a, a picture perfect soft landing is what, what they're on track for. Joining me around the table here in New York, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management, Priya Misra of TD Securities and Gershon Distant Found of Alliance Bernstein. Priya, to begin with you, a solid payrolls report. I thought we'd start this show by making up excuses for a weak jobs number. We've got a strong one. Right. So we actually went in looking for this weak number with the whole GM strike. I actually don't think this, this number told us a whole lot. We've known that the labor market is very strong. It is slowing from that 175,000 pace to the, you know, 130, 140,000 pace. I think the big question is, is the global growth slowdown? Is the manufacturing slowdown, is, is that having an, an impact on the labor market? Not yet. So I think it actually solidifies this whole Fed pause. I'm not sure that the Fed is done because I think at some point when businesses have cut back on CapEx, they're going to have to cut back on hiring. So I think it's just not yet so far. You think the jury's still out on this economy? I think it is. I think, uh, you know, global growth continues to be pretty weak. The China PMI numbers are not really showing this big rebound. We haven't really had any stimulus. And I still go back to what Chair Powell said in July, that no business executive has gone to him saying that it's because of interest rates that they're not cutting CapEx. How are we solving this? We're cutting interest rates. So I don't know if they're actually putting enough the right stimulus in. So if the fundamentals are still weak, I think hiring is going to slow down over the next six months. I think this is just a slow uncertainty shock. So we're not seeing that sudden drop in payrolls that we're used to. But Michael. I think it was an okay report from the rather morose expectations. Let's remember it's one that's heavily distorted with the GM strike. It will be revised. It's backward looking. And I think what we should do is step back and say, if it's so wonderful, which the market seems to be pricing in today, why does GDP continue to drift lower? Why are we at 1.9% GDP growth and not at 2.9%? I wouldn't put too much into a single report today. Does all of that resonate with you, Gershon? Yeah, I broadly agree. I think that yeah, the number was strong, but that's we didn't learn anything new by that. So at 10 o'clock, you saw the manufacturing number, which the good news is it ticked up a little bit, but it's still very weak, about a standard deviation below what's normal. And at some point, those are going to have to reconcile. Either we're going to get a recovery, or I think more likely we're going to end up seeing it spill over into continued comp business confidence and it'll it impact hiring, unemployment. And what's important, I think, is looking at the broad fixed income and equity markets are telling you two different stories. The equity markets are siding with the consumer, which makes sense on the surface. It's a much bigger part of the economy, but the fixed income markets are signaling caution. Well, let's get to the analysis first and then get to the market call. You've touched on something really important, the sub-50 ISM. And to characterize the U.S. economy as a tug of war between consumption, resilient, and business spending, really quite weak. Do you think we need to resolve that in the coming quarter then, that at some point either the consumer cracks or business spending picks up? I do think that's the case. I think, I don't know if it's in the next quarter, but in the next, let's say, six to nine months, we're going to see. The, the question really is, and you're not going to see this in the data, is this a blip or is this the start of a trend? Has the kind of, um, I, I guess, the there's no certainty, but at least the trade tensions have been on the back burner for a little bit. Is that giving business more confidence? You're not really seeing that in kind of the, the earnings calls that companies are doing. They're still saying they're very, very uncertain. So at some point, we think it's going to have to spill over to the consumer. The economy, though, to many people watching this program might be quite good. They might see it and say, you know what, things look resilient, things are okay, the Fed's made the right decision, they're validated by taking a pause. Are you saying they're making a mistake, Priya? I think given what they know right now, they've 
sort of exhausted this preemptiveness. I, th I think uh, Chair Powell does face a pretty divided committee. He had half the committee that didn't want to cut at all. I think they pushed this insurance cut mid-cycle adjustment as much as they could. Now they really need validation on the data. So we have been calling for a pause, but I think this market pricing in only one rate cut next year, I think that's much too optimistic because we still don't know that, that the, uh, the global growth picture has, has really moved much higher. So I think if the hiring picture slows down, we actually think the Fed will be back in and as, as Chair Powell said, they need a material reassessment. So it's not going to be one rate cut. It's going to be three rate cuts or, or more. You think we could get three cuts in 2020? That is our forecast because we think over the next six months, there will be that material reassessment, which will force them to come in and at least 275. Maybe they'll have to do more. But if there's no recession, we're not forecasting a recession, but they'll at least 275. For what it's worth, I don't think you're too lonely around this table today. I got the Bob Michael notes around about an hour ago. <laughs> Listen to this. The Fed is behind the curve. They overestimate the probability of compromise on the trade front and underestimate the spillover impact from manufacturing to services and employment. You sound quite bearish, Bob Michael. I do. And I think what's missing in all of this is going down to the grassroots level. And what we're hearing from companies is they're struggling with margin pressure. So they're feeling the impact of trade. They're feeling the impact of higher cost on, from their suppliers. And it's having an effect. How do companies traditionally respond? They cut costs. What does that mean? It means fewer employees and it means less capex. And I think all of that is in the horizon. It's approaching very rapidly. I think the Fed is somewhat naive to assume that everything is fixed for now. So I do expect things to continue to slow down. So I know Gershon is keen to get to the market call, so let's just get there. Okay. What is the market call in Treasuries right now? Are you saying we're a buy in and around 170? Without question, I think we've had the backup. I think there was good reason for it. I think we've had some crossover buying from tourists that were looking for some form of insurance from other asset classes they own. Now the big money's coming in. The ECB has turned on the spigot again to QE, and you're now seeing at a higher yield, and with the slowdown people are seeing globally, they're looking to the U.S. as a high-yield market again. Gershon? I wouldn't go as far as to say duration is a buy at this point. I do think to, you know, is it possible we get three or more cuts next year? Absolutely it's possible. It's certainly a lot greater probability than the Fed's going to start hiking again. I don't see any, any real scenario that that happens in the next couple of years. When you say there's a divergence, though, in the market between equity and fixed income, what pockets of fixed income are you focused on at the moment? Well, the, the overall uh, level of, of the yields. Right? If, if you believe what the equity market is telling you, you know, you have 20% plus return in the S&P year to date, and just where multiples have gotten to, you wouldn't have yields as low as they are. That's the dichotomy. Yields should be a lot higher if you believe the economy is going to be fine. I think, look, the real thing, and we, we've talked about this in the past, John, is yeah. we're 11 years into an expansion. It'll be nice, in theory, right, it'll be nice if the world worked that central banks had this magic power to kind of keep us steady. The reality is there are shocks in the system. It wouldn't necessarily be the worst thing in the world. I know investors don't want to hear this, but it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if we had a mild slowdown. Again, we're not using the R word, but we could have below trend growth for quite some You've time. You've made that How point strange. before. The markets are telling me exactly the same thing. There's a tremendous pile of cash that's been printed over the last decade, sloshing around on the 17 trillion size bank, uh, central bank balance sheet. It's looking for a home. It's taking bond yields right down in government bonds because there's no inflation. And although things are slowing down, until you see a recession and until you see a projection of much lower corporate earnings, money will continue to go into equities and continue into, to go into credit. And it's sort of this Goldilocks environment that the central banks have created for now. But it certainly doesn't look like the future to us. Priya? I think there's another dichotomy that I'll highlight, which is every time the Fed historically has eased, the curve has steepened, inflation expectations have gone up, risk assets have gone up. This time, we got the risk asset move. We did not get the curve move, the curve flattened. All these three rate cuts, the curve has flattened, and inflation expectations have declined. So the market, the rates market, agrees with Bob here that the Fed is making a mistake. I think the equity market is still saying that everything is fine for now, so therefore, reach for yield. That might be the way you actually reconcile these two markets. The real scary thing, though, is question is if we do get weakness 
are, is further easing going to matter? Like the Fed can pat themselves on the back all they want. The reality, I think you said it earlier, the, 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 the problem in the economy wasn't that the price of credit was too high, right? Yeah. So the Fed, maybe it did impact sentiment, made business a little bit more confident, but it's not like a, a 75 basis points makes a whole lot of difference in the real economy. And if we get weaker, is it really going to make a difference if we cut closer to zero? Just to wrap up this conversation, just, just quickly, Bob, please weigh in. It, it does, because we've already seen that mortgage refis are at a very high level. So high, in fact, that the Treasury has reached its cap on what it can reinvest in the mortgage market. So these drops lower in yield do create some discretionary income across the board. Consumer level right now, corporate America down the road. I agree. It's keeping the consumer going right now. But what happens, you know, how much more is there to go? What happens if we start to see weakness? Is further rate cuts going to, gonna, you're not going to get that same response as you have. So why not, if you don't have inflation, why not go to zero? Just get to zero. You don't have to worry about inflation. See what happens. You can always take it back. You sound like a White House official, Bob Michael. We can uh, become Europe. Get, get down to zero. I guess we can become Europe. You two don't need me today, I'm sure of that. Priya Mizra and I will go and do another show <laughs> shortly. <laughs> Sticking with us around the table. Coming up on this program, the auction block. A quiet week in high yield. That conversation is coming up next. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. I'd like to head to the auction block now and begin over in Europe on the continent where primary market sales jumped 47 percent last month. The second biggest increase this year with multi tranche offerings from CK Hutchinson, Daimler and Eli Lilly. In the United States, investment grade borrowers sold over $26 billion of debt over just two sessions ahead of the Fed. Danaher among the standouts issuing $4 billion to back its purchase of GE's biopharma business. And finally in high yield, U.S. junk bond issuers largely remain on the sidelines this week. A grand total of two deals, pricing for roughly $3.3 billion. Staying with high yield, BlackRock's Rick Reader saying credit quality is taking centre stage. You got to get income. I mean, every time I think the high yield market has run out of gas and it's not interesting, I try and buy high quality high yield and high quality loans today. It's really hard to buy it, but you can buy as much as you want of the, of the weaker stuff. Demand for yield continues. Back with me around this table, Bob Michael, Priya Misra, Gershon Distenfeld. Gershon, your view on the demand for credit right now? Well, I wish I could disagree with Rick. I like to disagree with him. But it's, it, there's nothing really new here. It remains a very bifurcated market. You look at anything, I hate to use ratings classes, let's call it for better words, double B solid paper, there's a huge bid for it. And, you know, deal comes, it's way oversubscribed. And anything with any hair on it whatsoever, you really can't give away. And, you know, if you would have told us at the beginning of the year, high yield's going to be up 12, 13 percent, whatever it's up, up year to date, I would have said triple C's would be up 20, double B's would be up six. It's kind of the reverse. Double B's are up close to 14, triple C's are up five. And we think, you would think that's an opportunity to kind of go the other way. We don't think so. We think the idiosyncratic risk and the credit risk, especially if we're right on the economy, is in the triple C area. Do you agree with that, Bob? Um, there's certainly a lot of demand for, for high yield going on here. I do agree with Gershon. If we look at the, the loan market versus the high yield market, the loan market now has a yield that's 50 to 70 basis points higher than the high yield market. Usually that's inverted. So that's telling you that investors in the loan market are demanding more yield to hold those securities because that's where all the concern about the cov light and lack of covenants resides. Priya? I think we've gone from reach for yield to reach for quality, which is very different from where we were last year. If you look at fourth quarter of last year, it was the high grade stuff that actually underperformed. So I read that more as a liquidity event. What I'm reading now, uh, the, the tea leaves actually suggest that investors are getting nervous about late cycle behavior. They're actually going up in quality. This is normally a good sign for treasuries, for example, because you would want something to hedge. The only hedge for a risk asset now is going to be long duration treasuries. So, you know, I, I would still rather be lower in, in rate, higher in quality, even within the credits. One market. thing I've spent the week trying to get my head around, I'd love the insight from all of you on this, is whether what we're seeing is a broader credit risk story or just pockets of idiosyncratic stress. So you bring up high yield, for instance, that's spread between double Bs versus triple Cs. What's the signal there? If you look at leverage loans, is that just an aversion to floating rate or is there some credit risk starting to bubble away at the bottom end of the market? What is it, Gershon, for you? Yeah, I think there is credit.
higher risk at the bottom end of the market. And that's why you have to be cautious. And it's hard to make generalizations. I think there's parts of the levered loan market, and you know, this is a little heresy for, for me saying it. I actually think there are parts that are cheaper than the high yield market. There is one risk, though, that's not credit related that I think investors aren't talking about at all. And maybe it's low probability, given that we don't think yields are going to go up all that much. But if they did, people are buying a lot of paper maturing in, let's say, five to seven years that have call dates in one to two years. And if what happened in 2013 happens, now again, it's not a base case, that paper is going to lengthen in duration tremendously and underperform by a large amount. Again, maybe not high probability, but big impact if it happened. But Michael? I think people aren't afraid of credit right now. I think every time they try to go up in quality or raise a little cash, they don't see the default rates going up, they don't see the, the dire earnings warnings, and then they're forced back into the market. And until we get further into the cycle and see things slow down more, and you see it in corporate earnings, money will continue to go into the credit market. You think they should be afraid, though? I absolutely do think they should Why? be a crate because I do think that, that the cracks there are real. I do think that what you're seeing in the loan market, there's been a tremendous amount of credit extended uh, that's wound up in CLOs that doesn't have the covenants that you need. You can't just simply dismiss, oh well, high yield market, it's energy. You are getting legitimate earning warnings. Somebody like Caterpillar is out saying, hey, guess what? Tariffs in the trade war are having an impact and our guidance going forward is going to be lower. It's easy to get out now and wait it out rather than think you're going to be the person that picked up the last nickel in front of the steamroller. Gershon, you want to weigh in? So here's where I disagree. I, I, I share your concern in the short term about the high yield market. The question is, where are you going to go with the money? That's always the question. And where, how we view it is, you just have to expect lower returns. In essence, the very strong returns we've seen this year have borrowed from the future. And investors have to expect lower than coupon returns probably over the next year or two. We've seen that in the year so far through 2019. If you can bring up the high yield spread here in the United States just over the last year or so, for much of the last 10 months or so, we've established this really, really tight trading range. And I say it tight, it's in and around 350 to 450. We get to the year-to-date tights, we bounce off them. We've just done that in the last couple of weeks. We approach 425, 450, and the buying starts again. Priya, what does that chart tell you? When do we start to break out of that kind of trend? And what does it tell you about the jitters of this market? Not once, not twice, but three times this year. Tells you the pressure to sort of make returns. Uh, and the fact that the US consumer, the service sector is still fairly resilient. You can't really point to any data and say this is showing that the consumer is falling apart, that default rate is going to pick up, which is why I think we're staying in that range. I actually think that's the range in which treasuries are also going to stay. So the 10 year stays 150 to 2%. It's it's when you start seeing, and you know, I'm, I'm watching for PMI data. You know, I, I think that's more leading than the labor market. If you see the service PMI number continuing to decelerate, you know, in, in the months ahead, I wonder if then the macro environment will come up more for the credit investors, where they say, really, it's about time that we cut back on the lower quality. So I think until then, until the data is okay, I think we stay within that narrow range. Final word, question. Averages are misleading. Spread on double Bs is inside of 240. On triple Cs, it's over a thousand. Until you see that trend break, those are going to kind of offset each other and you're going to kind of hover in this level. Really smart stuff, guys. You're going to be sticking with me. Coming up on the program, still ahead, the final spread, the week ahead, featuring a rate decision from the Bank of England and a slew of global PMI reports. That conversation is coming up next. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. City. I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the final spread. Coming up over the next week, starting on Monday, we get Kaishin, China and Eurozone PMIs, then a slew of Fed speak on Tuesday and Wednesday, including Fed Presidents Kashkari, Kaplan, Evans, Williams and Harker. Then on Thursday, we get a rate decision from the Bank of England. And finally, on Friday, inflation numbers out of China. With me for some final thoughts, I'm pleased to say Bob Michael, Priya Misra and Gershon Distenfeld. Guys, let's get to the news to end out the week on the trade story. China says it has achieved a consensus in principle with the United States at a phone call today between top trade negotiators. How do you characterize the story between the United States and China currently? Because what amazes me, particularly on this program, is how assessments of the global economy seem to change from week to week based on where we are with the trade talks and from just one data point to the next. 
So I'll say I think there's an assumption in the market that the weakness in global growth and manufacturing is all because of trade. And I would argue the weakness started well before the trade war. Now the trade war hasn't helped, but I think if you think it's all it all hinges on this U.S.-China trade deal, then you know, uh, do we have a deal? Do we do, uh, uh, do we not have a deal? I, I think that's why uh, why a lot of people are getting whipsawed. When I look at this headline, I mean, it's saying in principle. I thought we had this two weeks ago, so we have no details. Our view is it's going to be it's it's going to be agriculture products, no rollback of tariffs. So if I'm a corporate and I'm thinking about my supply chain over the next year, the worst case scenario has been taken off the table. I don't think my base case has changed a lot. There's still a lot of uncertainty. Gushin. We live in an environment where we can get a Trump from the, uh, tweet from the President of the United States at any time that says something different. And that's the real key. It's the uncertainty. If the tariff situation was actually bad, but it was more certain, I think that business would have more confidence than just complete uncertainty. And remember, this is a president who started up with Mexico not that long ago. It's not just about China. It's unpredictable. And you know, that, I'm not just putting it all on this president. The political situation is very, is very uncertain. We don't know, you know, it's easy to say the election's a referendum on Trump. We can't ignore the fact that the Democratic Party has very different ideas of how to manage the economy, and markets aren't pricing that in today. But Michael? We want to be hopeful that there will be a compromise on trade, but we're skeptical. What does this actually mean? Did they agree to continue the conversation? Is it we sell agricultural products which we need to sell to somebody who needs to buy them? What about the real issue? What about IP rights? What about tech? What about security? When will all of those things be discussed? That's why we have a skepticism. I think we all hope we'll make some progress. Guys, you know what we're going to do now? We'll do the final round, the rapid fire round. Three quick questions, three quick answers, if possible. The Fed has done a Fed pause before. It started earlier this year. It lasted nine months, and then they started to cut interest rates, eight or nine months. Will it last more or less this time around? More or less? Gershon. Less. Bob. Less. Priya. Less. There's some consensus. The year end on the 10 year yield, will it be higher or lower than where the two year yield is right now? For as a reference point, the two year yield right now is 157. Will the 10 year end the year higher or lower than where the two year yield is right now? Bob? Lower. Priya? Lower. Gershon? Do you have a coin? <laughs> I don't have a coin. But I don't know. You don't know. Third and final, pick your poison. Leverage loans or high yield? You've got to hold one asset class right now. Just pick your poison. Leverage loans or high yield? And Gershon, I'm looking for a surprise at the end of this program. Bob Michael, loans or high yield? High yield. Priya? Neither, but if you force me to high yield. Gershon Distenfeld, loans or high yield? Three months, loans, 12 months, high yield. I always knew it was going to be nuanced. Bob Michael, Priya Misra, Gershon Distenfeld, guys, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. What a week. That does it for us from New York City, for our audience worldwide. We'll see you next time, same time, same place. This was Bloomberg Real Yield. This is Bloomberg TV.